So in the previous lesson, we talked about the International Collaboration on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And, and we want to have a look at uh, what they're up to. So one of the things they've come up with is what's referred to as the uh, General Circulation Model, or the GCM. And some people call this the Global Circulation Model. That, that, that works. But basically what we're doing here is we, we now look at the planet Earth as a whole. Rather than looking at individual places, we try to look at the entire climate of what's going on on the whole earth. Now, this isn't easy to do as you can possibly imagine the the number of computers that are required to calculate these changes in global climate it's pretty intense to try to get a, a model on this one and a lot of work is being done to refine and improve these computer models that are being used to calculate the general circulation model. We do have some political agreements where we've gotten together uh, various countries to sign some agreements. One famous one was the Montreal Protocol in 1987. And what this was about was 182 uh, nations agreed to ban the production of chlorofluorocarbons, chlorofluorocarbons, or abbreviated as CFCs. So as you can imagine, these are carbon molecules that contain lots of chlorines and fluorines. We used to use them as coolants in refrigerators and air conditioners, uh, but we found out, unfortunately, the hard way, that CFCs react with ozone, which is O3, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, ozone's a big deal because ozone blocks harmful ultraviolet radiation. We need ozone to protect us, otherwise we're all going to get skin cancer, etc. Uh, the problem with the, the CFCs, you can see by this uh, this uh, sketch here, uh, the CFCs uh, react with ozone. It, it frees up a chlorine here. The chlorine reacts with an ozone uh, molecule, which is O3, and breaks it apart. And so we get an ordinary oxygen here, and then what will happen is another oxygen will come in and react with that other oxygen, and once again your chlorine is now free uh, to go back and do some more damage again. So this is very, very threatening as to what these chlorine and fluorine molecules can do to the ozone by breaking them apart. So what this has resulted in is due to the Coriolis effect and the winds, etc., we've ended up with this sort of hole in the ozone layer in the southern hemisphere. And what that means is if you actually ended up in this area, if you're doing exploration there, you kind of have to protect yourself a little bit more from the ultraviolet radiation because down here the ozone is very, very thin. So we had an agreement in 1987 to say, look, we're going to ban production of CFCs. They've replaced all of these chemicals in our refrigerators and our air conditioners. And the idea is, you know, let's not make the bad situation worse by adding any more to the atmosphere. Uh, we've also had other meetings. There was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, known as the UNFCCC. And what this was is a, a meeting that took place in 1992 in which we would try to make a plan for how shall we do or how shall we build any future climate change agreements. In other words, it's sort of like a plan to make a plan. And they agreed on the following, that any action that they take in the future must not threaten the global food production. Well, we've got to eat, obviously. And it must not threaten the economic interests of any nation. Uh, all actions must support sustainable development. In other words, anything that we do must allow for the fact that future generations will be able to survive and, and, and make do with what's left on the planet. So for, uh, an example would be any forest harvesting that you do must not diminish its value as a carbon sink. Well, in, in Canada, we do a lot of forestry. And so in Canada, we're going to have to make sure that any trees that we cut down doesn't diminish our carbon sink. We may have to, for example, make sure that we replant. A big agreement was the Kyoto Protocol uh, on Climate Change, and this was an international agreement to reduce the anthropogenic production of greenhouse gases. Now, by this word here, we basically mean man-made. Anthropogenic, we're talking about man-made production of greenhouse gases. Uh, 160 countries originally signed this one, including Canada. We signed on in 1998. And the goal that they set up for themselves was to have a 5% reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions by 2012. By 2012. Now, that was pretty ambitious, and many countries felt that we couldn't do it. Um, we were one of them, as we'll talk about later. Uh, one of the incentives they had for countries was what was called the Emission Reduction Credits, or the ERCs. And the idea was uh, we could help each other 
by receiving credit for trying to reduce our emissions. Uh, a developed country helps a developing country to reduce its emission, you would gain some credit on this. Uh, if a country helps uh, develops a practice to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, for example, they would receive carbon credits for this. And so here's a map showing the Kyoto Protocol participation map here. And the most interesting thing for us to notice, perhaps, is that one country, and that's us, Canada, we pulled out. Um, we decided politically that we could not participate in the Kyoto Protocol, that we could not meet its uh, its deadlines or its its, its requirements, and uh, we bailed. So it's as simple as that. Um, here is a, a couple of ideas on how to stabilize these greenhouse gas levels, and they sort of involve two sides of the equation. One technique is called sequestering the carbon, and the idea here is to take the carbon that we produce and bury it back down inside the lithosphere so it can't get back out into the atmosphere. Now this one's kind of controversial because number one, you know, we're not too sure if the technology really works that well. And uh, number two, we're not too sure if any carbon that we sequester is going to stay put and not find its way back out or, or cause pollution in other areas that we're not aware of. On the other side of the equation, if we want to try to uh, help out with the carbon problem, we talk about things like reforestation. And so the idea again being that if we're going to chop down trees because we need the lumber, of course, we're destroying our carbon uh, sink there. And so we need to replant these trees to regrow them again to maintain the ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere.